Not one saga is absolutely perfect. No, not even yours, Cell. Perfect by name, but not necessarily by nature. Hey folks, Marsico X here. Today, we wish to share with you Have an Eye's personal thoughts about Dragon Ball sagas. What exactly makes and breaks a Dragon Ball saga, I hear you say? What are the strongest and weakest points of almost every arc of our beloved medium? Today, we are going to discuss just that. And before you ask, the original Dragon Ball series will not be covered here, since the traditional saga format was in its infancy at that time. So to compare it to the latter sagas in equal measure would be a little bit unfair in our regard. Despite this little caveat though, this seems to be a pretty bold statement. I mean, after all, it feels like looking into the core of the series and trying to find an objective and dispassionate source of narrative delight and despair. Well, you guys know that we are pretty biased in certain aspects, so that's out of the picture, but we will try to approach the topic from different angles. Our focus also will be around the Dragon Ball series from Z onwards. As again, the original Dragon Ball was actually pretty coherent when you think about it, and most of the problems that we have are mostly aimed at around the dated humour, and Goku being pretty dull in the first arc, basically being a blank canvas. Whilst the biggest power of those stories came from how adventurous and whimsical they were. They were charming, so again, not being included here. So to cut to the chase, let's take a quick journey through every saga after that, starting from the Saiyan saga. So depending on the situation, we often tend to think about this as part of an overall freezer influence storyline, the first half of Dragon Ball Z. We usually divide our Dragon Ball Z into the three big bads, you know, Freezer, Cell, Boo. But this time we will make an exception. And before you say anything, Vegeta I know is a baddie, but he does become a goodie. I'm talking about the big bads that stay big bads. Fans who started their adventure with Z, having not watched the first series, might not have this problem, but for all of those that began their adventure with the original series, uh, it might feel a little bit off. Yes, you have familiar characters who are now aged up, but the mood of Dragon Ball Z in comparison is different. It's not nearly as charming as it once was, and the stakes are much more grave. I can imagine if you watch the first Dragon Ball and then watch Dragon Ball Z, it's like watching Battlestar Galactica. You think, man, that's bleak. Look how serious it all got, even when you compare it to later parts in the first series. Yes, I know, OG Dragon Ball did have its dark moments, to be sure, but any remaining whimsy sort of gets crushed when we're introduced to Raditz. Also, if you, like our friend the artist formerly known as Nexus Mania, now known as Kaiju-kun, liked your heroes having those amazing journeys, as well as those adventures to make the character who they were, you're in for a bad start to proceedings. Most of this story consists of fighting in wastelands that are now, quite frankly, a meme at this point. Or just character training to fight in more wastelands. Yeah, that might be disappointed to see. As well as disappointed to see your favourite characters drop their adventurer gear and sort of become irrelevant. But what definitely makes the Saiyan saga though, are the stakes. And honestly, I don't think we'll ever see them as high in relation to the previous arc again. It actually kind of peaked early. You open your arc with showing that everything our characters learned was wrong, that the weakest of the new villains can take out Goku of all people with actually minimal difficulty, and it totally flipped our monkey man story, with him being offed after just five episodes, like his brother. Now that does count for something, and not only that, but the fights in this arc are amongst some of the most beloved encounters within Z. They are still a healthy mixture of key-based tricks and martial arts, remember, like the original, and they seem more tense than before, but no wonder this saga got a lot of people excited. And sadly, for too many Westerners, it was actually their first port of call with Dragon Ball, and it might have given off the wrong impression that Dragon Ball was all about the fighting from the start. So again, my litmus test, Dragon Ball Super Episode 69. Then we have the Freezer Saga, and listen, we'll tell you right now, the Freezer Saga <laughs> as some of the worst filler in the entirety of Dragon Ball. We know that this is symptomatic of the medium, but at the time, okay, yeah, yeah, we're gonna have to be fair here, they were kinda rushed. The gap between the manga and the anime at this point, in terms of release from one another, was very, very short. It got down to only eight weeks between the two. Time was very short between Toriyama publishing the chapters and the actual episodes coming out. Still though, we have fake Nemec, the endless stalling for time in the fights, that weird 
camouflage space balloon. We don't need to tell you how the Goku Freezer fight fell victim to that too. It's basically now become a bit of a joke. Now, don't get me wrong, the Namekians themselves were cool and interesting, but their planet was just a less populated palette swap of Earth. You know, green sky instead of blue. But luckily, this is also the saga that expanded upon the universe and has shown us a bigger scope and introduced a very extravagant pack of villains, courtesy of Freezer and his men. So despite, or maybe because of the boring backgrounds, they actually stand out even more, so maybe it was for the best. Freezer, the Ginyu Force, Zarbon, the Doria, they are some of the most satisfying villains to be seen decked in the schnoz. Not only that, but seeing Krillin, Gohan, and later Vegeta having to deal with opponents so much stronger than themselves and having to actually sneak around them to get the advantage and actually have it, it's actually a delight. Also, what goes without saying, we have the original Super Saiyan and fully realized redemption of Piccolo. Plus the key moments of the Freezer fight, they're still enjoyable. The manga version though without all the filler is still the definitive version though. Do give that a read when you can. Those points are so strong that it made a lot of us forgive some of the issues that the saga had, including the awful filler. But let's not pretend that they weren't there in the first place though. Next up is the Android and Cell saga. These two were actually going to lump as one, as there isn't really a clear cut transition like there was between the Saiyan to Freezer saga. We previously discussed what our problems are with the Cell Saga, despite it being one of our favorite moments in the entire series. So we shall keep it brief and you can check out the video. There is the juggling around of villains, the adaptive stupidity of the characters to keep the story going, and of course, the start of power creep. These are the three biggest sins of the Cell Saga, but we can discuss what we do like about it though. Despite juggling being a thing of the characters and powers and whatnot, we like every single one of the androids that show up. And yes, even 19. 19 was a weird clown man with a very funny voice in the original dub, but we have a weird fondness towards him. He at least was engaging enough that we, you know, remember him. Dr. Shiro is one of the most underrated characters in the show. 16, 17, and 18, and their road trip are a delight to watch. And then there's, of course, Mr. Perfect Cell. Yes, he can throw a mighty tantrum, and yes, he has that unfortunate nucleus issue, and yes, he gets his transformations in questionable ways, and a lot of dumb luck, but he is just so gosh darn cool, and his charisma just steals every single scene he's in. Also, we finally have both Goku and Gohan growing up. Well, I mean, okay, that latter one won't last for long, but... Y you know, as well as of course opening the route to redemption for Vegeta this time through the introduction of Trunks, who is another beloved character. Also, it ties a neat little bow around the whole Red Ribbon Army motif from the original Dragon Ball. Nice little callback. Now, we get to the Boo Saga. And oh boy, where to start? This is quite possibly the most grotesque of the Z arcs, without a doubt. That can be a good thing or a bad thing. Though we do have that Looney Tunes-esque moments that do contrast pretty heavily with some of the gorier scenes, the ones with brutality that would put the early Saiyan saga to shame. Boo is also an opponent who overstayed his welcome though. Also, the infamous inability of Toriyama to keep Gohan as the main character of Z was in large part here in this story. People like to argue that Dragon Ball is actually Goku's story, but you see, Z begins with us being introduced to Gohan by Goku. So you know, Z's kind of Gohan's story, at least it was, we had certain expectations. And then the pacing of the Boo Saga is pretty weird. And you have Gotenks. Yeah. As for the good stuff, once again, we want to remind you about the other video, but to keep it short, we have the vibrant colors and fascinating villain designs, adding fusion, and finalizing Vegeta's redemption arc. Also adding possibly the closest to a successful romance that Toriyama has ever wrote with Gohan and Videl. Well, now that we're done with Z, let's go to GT. As chronologically speaking, it was created before Super. The Black Star Dragon Ball saga was, well, it was a weird idea from the beginning. Ambitious, but a little bit rubbish. We think that turning Goku into a kid missed the mark right at its conception. Instead of allowing Goten, Trunks and Pan, maybe Oob, to take the reins, it gave us a mascot Goku that to this day plagues the personality of Super Goku. Not only that, but the story felt pretty uninspired and they were unable to return to the original Dragon Ball whimsy. Now let's mention the good stuff because yes, GT did have good things about it. I mean, I guess it's cool to see the protagonist travel again. Some of the alien designs are actually good. 
and adult President Trunks, save from the Ascot, is a pretty decent character. Different from future Trunks, which is very important. You know, it's just sad though that he wasn't actually allowed to do much. Also, it would have been great to see Super Saiyan Pan. I mean, come on, it to makes total sense. Then we have the Baby Saga, which is really the second part of the Black Star Dragon Ball Saga. And well, the biggest issue, once again, putting Goku at the forefront with his friends and family in the background. However, we have one truly excellent villain of the arc, and this feels more like a traditional Dragon Ball story this time around. The writers actually realised by the time you got to episode 3 of GT that what they were trying to do to try and recreate Dragon Ball didn't work and they really should have stuck to what they knew. Also, Super Saiyan 4, which is a fan favourite element of GT, and Dragon Ball in general actually. Then there is something that we can associate with every GT saga, characters having to deal with the consequences of their actions. Thank you. Or at least the actions of their ancestors, before it all falls apart again with those six episodes that dared to call themselves a saga, the Super 17 saga. Moving on. Uh, okay, okay. I guess the only good thing about this mini arc is that the show seems to be at least self aware of the fact that Dr. Mew and Dr. Juro are the same person. And then there's the villain cameos. I mean, Vegeta offing Nappa, again, was kind of funny. And the rest is. The rest is just a narrative mess. Uh, oh, okay, I guess it was fun to see Freezer and Cell team up. Okay. Then the Shadow Dragon Saga. Some of the dragons are a bit too goofy, and their motivation doesn't really work. Since Shenron is introduced too late to really mean much to us, he doesn't really have the impact that Toei was going for. Once again, Goku, with some help from Vegeta, plays the first fiddle. Same old, same old. That being said, we do have Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta, if you actually like fusion that's a good thing. The idea of Dragon Balls becoming the source of peril, that's pretty great. The fight against the Mega Shenron is solid, and hey! At least he has a somewhat unique design. He's very spiky, he's a spiky boy. I mean, hey, come on, at least he doesn't have another cell face. Also the ending, that's good. It's emotional, bittersweet, and really has finality to it. If there was effort put into GT, it definitely came here for this finishing sequence. Okay, let's get on to Super. The first two sagas have already been discussed by us in great detail. Basically, their biggest problem is that, put simply, they're retellings of the first two movies only worse. And in the beginning, it actually felt really dated. Especially when you think about it, the Resurrection F arc just came out in the movie theatres a few months before we saw it on Crunchyroll and streaming services. It was weird. But okay, to add some credit where credit's due, some of the filler added to the story, it was actually kind of enjoyable. Super might be the series with some of the best filler and character interactions in the series, so that, as well as some additional lore, is always a good thing. A lot of the problems of those sagas are connected to the problem of the source material, especially the Resurrection F bit. Yes, it's great to see Tagoma not being completely wasted here and having a role in Ginyu's brief return, but it's a little too brief for my liking. And it's also part of Vegeta's laziest offing of a baddie. I mean, seriously, here, I mean, the animation doesn't help, it was already bad. It looks here he's not making any effort at all. I remember when Havarok and I were at my place and watched Resurrection F the day after we saw Broly in the cinema. Well, okay, for me it was the second time. Upon watching it, we knew that something felt a little off, but it was hard to say exactly what at the time. Sure, Super Saiyan Blue had a weird introduction and the story was not the best, but it still had some neat moments. And today, I actually think we know the answer. Both the movie and the saga managed to make Freezer boring. This is why we were all so anxious to see him return the Tournament of Power, and probably why there was such an initial negative backlash, especially after seeing Boo not taking part. Not only was it due to them rehashing the character again, but they failed to do something truly refreshing with him the first time in Resurrection F. Luckily though, in the later saga as well as the Broly movie, Freezer is a scene stealer, so it seems that someone did their homework. They managed to adapt Freezer into the new era of Dragon Ball as a regular villain. Okay, it turned out alright. Now we have the Universe 6 arc, the first truly original super arc, and it was a little bit clunky. Once again, Goku and Vegeta were allowed to have the most important fights in this arc, save for Batamo. Then Frost's overall allegiance was a little disappointing. And then we have the whole thing with Monaka. It could have been subverted even more, quite frankly, trying not to be so predictable. You can check out my video here about how I think what might have been for that character, how you could have done him well. That being said, Universe 6's introduction worked, and we still have a fondness for those characters, even Frost in his new cowardly guise. 
Also, at least we had Piccolo doing something, and banter between the Cat Brothers was there, so that's a plus. Okay, next we have the, uh, the Copy Vegeta saga. Brian Drummond in it was a good. Let's move on. The Future Trunks or Goku Black Saga. Well, the concept of evil Goku, though not entirely new, was pretty well carried out, actually. Not only that, Zamasu was honestly a pretty effective villain. Despite us not liking him at the time, it got under our skin, and that's good. But he was a little bit deep for Dragon Ball, though. It felt like something that Madhouse or Studio Mappa would come up with. Its biggest problem was how convoluted it got. I mean, if you have to write a little diagram to explain how timelines work, that writer needs to be sacked. Then, of course, is how the way they handled the ending. They just shoved it under a rug. The treatment of future trunks just was divisive at best and utterly abhorrent at worst. I mean, it was great to see him again, though he had some cool scenes and all, but the ending was downright aggravating. Okay, though, we had some good fights and a quotable main villain. I guess that's cool. As for the Universe Survival Saga, non-existent stakes, weird pacing, Jiren being pretty boring despite being a pretty interesting concept as well as being well coolly designed, and of course characters being eliminated in very stupid ways. I'm looking at you, Piccolo. You forget you have stretching arms. And this all decreases the overall worth of this part of Dragon Ball. You can also see that communication between the writers for each episode was limited, as some episodes contradict one another in very unusual ways that don't make sense. Take episodes 118 and 119, for example. But then again, we have a lot of interesting fighter designs. They managed to actually make 80 different characters. They pulled it off. And some of the best battles in Super, actually. Not only that, they were able to bring back interest in Frieza and make him entertaining in the eyes of many. Also, the original version of Ultimate Battle, yeah, that's pretty catchy. So that leaves us with the Morrow Saga. But for that, you need to wait for a separate video that we will make when the conclusion of that arc in the manga is upon us. As you can see, we seem to be more critical about the new stuff, but at the same time, let's not pretend that it's all bad, that there is nothing good there just because it's new, or that the older parts were completely faultless. That's just not the case. It's kind of fun though to rush through these and find their essence in a way. See if you can boil it down to a paragraph. Unless of course it's Super 17 or Copy Vegeta, which we can hopefully forget one day. We're glad that at least there's no such thing as fake Namek. But what do you folks think? What made or broke certain sagas in your mind in Dragon Ball? Is there one arc that is utterly irredeemable for you? Leave a comment below and let's get this discussion going. And I shall see you in the next video. Catch you later.